Amen. Hey, all right. Yeah, thank you guys. Um, let's take our Bible and go to Mark chapter 10. Um, and the, um, the text is actually Mark. Yeah, uh, the, it says Matthew, I know, on your handout, but that was my fault. Um, I gave him the wrong book there. It should be Mark chapter 10. And so if you could be turning there, that'd be great. Um, you know, a few weeks ago, do you, you guys remember I did a message called, Help, I'm a Parent. Remember that? Act like you remember that. All right, good. All right. I thought about titling this one, Help, My Mother-in-Law's Driving Me Insane. But I thought that might not be a good title, especially seeing as how my mother-in-law goes to this church. Is she in here? Where is she? Where? Oh, my, there she is. Bless her heart. <laughs> All right. This is my mother-in-law, and I love her very dearly. Um, you know, you hear a lot of mother-in-law stories, and you hear a lot of bad stuff. My mother-in-law is a godly woman that loves the Lord. She, wor she works in children's ministry. She was over there at the 9 o'clock service, and now she's in here. Uh, but she's a godly woman and raised my wife up to love the Lord. And, and she is an encouragement, a blessing. Um, I've never had a problem with her. She's just a wonderful woman. Did I say all that right? Yes. Okay. All right. Good. <laughs> she didn't tell me what to say. I uh, actually, yeah, we have a great relationship. In fact, she says I'm her favorite son-in-law. <laughs> yes, I'm her only son-in-law. <clears throat> But, you know, a lot of guys don't have it that, that good, you know, mother-in-law problems. Uh, in fact, there was a, a fella that went with his wife and his mother-in-law on a trip to the Holy Land, to Jerusalem, and they went and saw the sites where Jesus was crucified, an empty tomb, you know, so forth, where uh, he rose from the dead, and they saw all those sites. Well, while he's over there, his mother-in-law passed away, and the undertaker asked the son-in-law, he said, now look, for five he said, for $5,000, we can ship her home. He said, or for 1000 we can bury her right here in the Holy Land and uh, have a nice service. The man thought for a minute, and he said, well, he said, um, hmm, you, you better ship her home. He goes, wow, you must really love your mother-in-law. He said, spend $5,000 to ship her home. He said, when, when you could spend $1,000 and have her buried and have a nice service and have her buried right here in the Holy Land, right here in Jerusalem. And the guy said, well, here's the deal. He said, a man died here 2,000 years ago, was buried, and three days later, he rose from the dead. <laughs> he said, with my mother-in-law, I can't take that chance. <laughs> <laughs> But as I said, I got a good mother-in-law. She's wonderful, and, um, and I, I mean that with all my heart. But, you know, in-law struggles, uh, they go back to the beginning of time, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of easy to understand why there are struggles. I mean, you think about it, uh, a husband and a wife come from two completely different families. You think about that. Think about that. Think about what that means. I mean, it could be simple things, different likes and dislikes. I mean, well, my family always orders pepperoni pizza. Well, my family orders anchovies on theirs, you know. And, and it's just different families, right? Different personalities in families. For example, some families are very reserved. They're just reserved, you know, and, and everybody's very reserved and quiet. Then you have other families that are very outgoing and loud and noisy, and, and when they get together, they raise the roof, you know, and you got to yell to talk over, to be heard. You know, that our house is like that, by the way. And, um, you know, you, you got to yell to be heard, you know, and, and so you got different personalities, different cultures, different tastes, different habits, different family rituals, right? Different ways of celebrating holidays and big events. Families have different ways of handling conflict and how they deal with conflict, you know? And some yell and scream and other ones just kind of clam up and everybody gets real quiet and, you know? And so it's like on and on and on we could go. And so now we're going to take two people that come from completely different backgrounds. We're going to bring them under the same roof and they're going to form a new family. Many times 
with their own families still in the same town, interjecting their opinions and their thoughts on the way that they should be doing things. And, and for many that come from divorced homes, well, then you can be dealing with multiple in-law families. You may have, uh, if it's a, you know, say your spouse comes from a divorced family, you may have two mother-in-laws, bless your heart. You may have two father-in-laws. You may have multiple brother and sister-in-laws, right, on two sides of the family. And, and so it can get really, really complicated. Um, many of you in here maybe have been blessed to have never experienced any in-law conflict at all, ever. Well, bless your heart. I mean, you need to write a book. Amen? I mean, <laughs> most people do encounter in-law trouble at some time or another at some level. Um, it, it may be a friendly disagreement. Uh, it many times can get and be a nasty, ugly scene. I mean, like, it can get so bad to where, like, you just don't go over to mom and dad's house much because the tension is so thick. Or maybe there's a great underlying resentment maybe between the husband and the wife because, you know, he knows she resents his family and he kind of resents her family. And then it leads to problems, you know, between the husband and the wife. Like, like the young couple that was going down the country road and they hadn't talked for miles. They were just sitting there stewing like this and wouldn't talk. And uh, they'd been fighting over these family issues, you know, her family and his family and fighting over it. And so they're going down the road in total silence for, for miles and so they, going down this country road, they pass this, uh, this farm, and there's a bunch of pigs and cows and mules. And so the wife just looks over at the husband and goes, relatives of yours? <laughs> he said, yep, in-laws. <laughs> and I mean, it can get nasty, amen? It can get nasty. Well question for you. Did God know that these problems would exist? Yes or no? Isn't God amazing? God dealt with this. In fact, God dealt with it at the very beginning with Adam and Eve. He dealt with it at the very beginning. And then Christ, during his earthly ministry, came along, and he quotes the passage from Genesis that talks about this and does some teaching on marriage. Look with me at Mark chapter 10, and let's begin reading in verse number 6. Mark 10, verse 6. All right, Jesus said, But from the beginning of the creation, so he's going back to Genesis, from the beginning of the creation, Jesus said, God made them, say that with me, how did he make them? Yeah. Male and female. Verse 7. For this cause shall a man, and there's a key word, and I want you to underline that, for this cause shall a man what? A little bit louder. What? Leave. It says he'll leave his father and mother and, and that word rhymes with leave. What is it? Cleave to his wife, and the two shall be what? One flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man put asunder. So Jesus here is teaching on marriage. And he's teaching that married couples, hear me now, married couples need to embrace their oneness as a married couple. They got to embrace that oneness. This passage here, Jesus gives us some insight into some possible barriers to that, some potential problems. He, in other words, one of the problems is, is that a husband and wife can fail to embrace their, uh, their, their, their uh, differences as male and female, because God made them male and female. God made us different. Okay, male and female are different. They just are different, and not just physically. God made us different, and so God made them male and female not to compete with each other. You're not to compete with one another as husband and wife. But he made you male and female to complement one another. It's a beautiful thing when that happens. But another problem is not only failing to embrace our differences as male and female, 
Jesus uh, identifies another problem as failing to cleave to one another sexually. That's what he means when he says you leave father and mother, you cleave to your wife, you come together sexually. That's a very important part. But then the third thing, the third potential problem is failing to fully leave our parents. He says you have to leave your father and mother. And that's the one I really want to focus on this morning is failing to fully leave our parents can sabotage our marriage relationship. Failing to fully leave our parents can, can sabotage our, uh, our marriage relationship. There's been so many numerous in-law jokes you know, throughout time. There, there's probably more in-law jokes than any other type of jokes. You know? and, and I've heard so many. There's a reason for that, though. And the reason why there are so many is because it has traditionally been a very tough issue to navigate successfully. Even if there's geographical distance between you and, you know, your family, with modern-day communication, cell phones, transportation, social media, it can still be an issue even if you don't live in the same city. So the message this morning is going to be very biblical, and it's going to be very simple and it's going to be very straightforward. There's going to be two main points to this message. One of the, the first points, gonna, I'm going to address married couples. What does God say to married couples when it comes to this issue with, with father, mother? Okay. Then I want to talk to parents. I want to talk to it from their end. You know, and so we're going to look at it from, from both sides of the coin, if you will, all right? So the first, the first side of the coin we'll look at is married couples, all right? So I want you to write this in your notes. Here's the point, very simple, and we're going to talk about what this means, but here's the point. Married couples, you have to fully leave your parents and cleave to one another. Married couples, you have to fully leave your parents and cleave to one another. The Bible principle is very simple concerning marriage. Leave and cleave. Say that with me. Leave and cleave. Leave and cleave, right? That's pretty simple. Look at verse 7, all right? Verse 7. Jesus said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. Now, obviously, guys, this is really important because God reiterates it repeatedly in Scripture. Look at this on the screen. Number one, he, he nails it at creation, right? Look at Genesis 2.24. At the very beginning, this is Adam and Eve. God says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother, shall be joined to his wife, and they will become one flesh. Adam and Eve, think about that. Adam and Eve didn't have parents. Adam had no mother-in-law. <laughs> Eve had no mother-in-law. All right, they, they, God created them from the dust of the ground. And so they didn't have parents. So why did God say this? God was saying it for the time when they had kids. And he's like, look, you are raising your kids up to leave you and cleave to somebody else. You got to let them go. All right. And then, and then the, second, the second time it's reiterated is during Jesus' earthly ministry in Matthew 19, 5. Look at this with me. Jesus said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So you have it at creation. Then you have Jesus reiterating it. Then it's reiterated again by Paul to the church, to, the, to us, the local church. Look with me at this verse, Ephesians 5, 31. Paul reiterates it, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. When you get married, you're no longer two, but one flesh. So that means that your physical identity changes. No longer are you primarily identified with your physical family that you grew up in, but your identity is now in one another. You become a new family unit. You are no longer two, but you are one flesh. For years, I was known as Don and Sally Proctor's son. That's how people knew me. That was my identity. 
That was my family. That was my home. I was known as Don and Sally Proctor's son. Now, I'm no longer known that way. I am known as Denise's husband. Okay? I'm identified with her. Most people in our life, that's how they know me, is that I'm, I'm Denise's husband. And, and she's Dan's husband, right? I mean, she's Dan's <laughs> wife. <laughs> you don't look a bit like a boy. <laughs> But, <laughs> you see, we, we are our own separate family unit. All right, so, so what does this look like on a practical level to leave your parents? What does that look like in everyday married life? Obviously, it's more than just leaving their house, you know, uh, you know just you know, getting all the stuff out of your dresser and getting the stuff out of your closet and throwing it in your car and you and your wife move into an apartment or move into a house. It's more than just physically moving to a different location. To leave your father and mother, what does that look like mentally, emotionally? Well, let me give you four thoughts. Number one is this, if you're taking notes. Number one is that means now your spouse comes first. Now your spouse comes first. This is a verse that um, that I had used a few weeks ago, and it's in 1 Corinthians 7, 4. Look at it with me. It says, the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. And the idea of that verse is that now that you're married, you live for each other. You live to please each other. So, listen now. (laughs) If that means, listen, if that means that pleasing my wife may displease my parents, so be it. So be it. I don't have to live with them every day. (laughs) But I do have to live with her. See? So I live to please her. She comes first, not my parents. So like... For us, um, on a practical level, like when we got married, um, my family was in Missouri, and her family lived here in town. So we decided that like for Christmas, for example, we would rotate. And so we'd spend Christmas Day here one year, and then the next year we would spend it in Missouri with all my extended family, my mom and dad and all them. Now, my parents were awesome. And they really were. My parents were awesome. They were never demanding on us. Um, But just, you know, just speaking totally hypothetically, let's say that they, they weren't that way. And let's say that my parents said, well, you know what? We don't get to see you all year long, and her parents do, and so we want to spend Christmas Day with you each year. And we think that's only right. Well, the answer would have been, Mom and Dad, I'm sorry, but no, really, we, we want to spend at least every other Christmas with her family. Now, you cannot allow your parents to control you after you're married. Your spouse is number one now. Your spouse is number one. Your spouse comes first. It's quiet in here. (laughs) You you, you guys laugh good, but you don't say amen very good. (laughs) You're like, should I say amen or oh me? I don't know which one to say. (laughs) All right. I'm giving you some good, good teaching right here. Your spouse comes first. Amen. All right, number two. Number two, you seek to protect your spouse. When we talk about leaving father and mother and, and cleaving to your, to your spouse, that means you seek to protect them. 
Remember, the Bible says that two become what? One flesh. So now look up here and think about what that means. If two become one, then that means if Denise is hurt, what would that logically mean for me? If she's hurt, I'm hurt. Why? Because we're one. That has to be the attitude and the mindset. And so that in regards to in-laws, you, you simply are not going to allow your parents to hurt your spouse. You're not going to allow your, your brothers or your sisters, your siblings or uncles or aunts or whoever it may be. You're not going to let them hurt your spouse. You're not going to stand for that. And, and, you, and you, you've got your spouse's back. You don't want to make them the bad person with your family. And that happens a lot where, you know, you want to, you want to be in good with your family, and so you make, you make the spouse look bad. That's not good. So, so, for example, going back to my illustration, you know, about Christmas, you, you think about that. How, how could I word that to my parents? Well, I, I, you know, the way I should word it is I should be like, hey, mom and dad, look, I know you want us to come up every year for Christmas. And look, I know Denise would probably do that if I asked her to do it. If I asked her to, she probably would. But I know Christmas is really, really important to her, and I want her to have Christmas with her family every other year. I sure hope you understand that. I'm the bad person with my family now. Not her. It's my decision. I've got her back. Rather than me saying, yeah, mom and dad, uh, you know I'd love to be up here every year, but I just can't get through to that woman. She just won't listen. She just don't get it. She won't. She refuses to get it. And, and I, you know I'd be up here in a heartbeat, but I just can't do anything with that woman. <laughs> well, now I've made her the bad person. Well, that's not good. If anyone's going to be the bad person with my parents, it needs to be me. Why? Because I'm their son. They got to forgive me. <laughs> but they can hold a grudge against her. So you see, I want to have her back. See? And so you seek to protect your spouse. Number three, this is a big one. Never draw your parents into your fights. This is so huge. I mean, as a, as a married couple... You are going to have everything from disagreements to nasty, knockdown, drag out fights. Now, I know I've met couples that have been married. We've been married 50 years and we've never had a crossword. I don't get that. I'm thinking, well, have they just forgotten? <laughs> are they lying? You know, I'm just like, I don't. I don't even, that doesn't, I don't get that, you know, but okay, whatever. But most couples do have fights. <laughs> Can I get an amen, huh? <laughs> All right. Most couples have fights. Most couples have disagreements. Most couples, sometimes it can get, I mean, the first year, sometimes it can really get bad. So listen to me. Neither of your parents should ever know about it when you have a fight. Ever. Ever. Most parents cannot be impartial, and it's not wise, and it's not fair, and it's not prudent to drag your parents into your marital disagreements. Not, just take my advice and don't do that. It's like the husband and wife that got in a big fight. The wife called her mom up on the phone and said, Mom, he's being mean to me again. He's fighting with me again. She said, Mom, I'm coming home to stay with you. Her mom said, No, dear, he must pay for his mistakes. I'm coming to stay with you. <laughs> he must pay for his mistakes. <laughs> I'm coming to stay with you. Listen, if things, get, if things get so heated that one of you needs to walk out of the house, okay, you, we, we got to, you know, some, one of you is like, cooler heads need to prevail. We, we got to pull the plug on this. We've got to, we, you know, we, we, we've got to defuse this, this time bomb right here, okay? And so one of you is going to walk. I'm not talking about divorcing. I'm just talking about one of you has got to walk and get away from the situation. Don't go to mommy and daddy's house. You go to a friend, go to a fellow church member, 
don't go to my house, all right, but go to, go to a fellow church member, <laughs> go to a hotel, <laughs> but do not go to your parents, okay? You are to leave and cleave. Say that with me. Leave and cleave. Leave means leave. You don't go back home. But we need counsel. Not from your parents, you don't. Okay? Your parents do not need to be your marriage counselors. Listen, it's fine to go to your parents for advice in any other area. In fact, that's a good thing to do. That's probably a real smart thing to do. They've probably been down roads you haven't been down yet. So I, it's probably a really good thing to maybe every once in a while get some advice from your parents, but not in regards to marital disputes. Keep them out of it. Number four, last thing is this. What does it mean to leave and cleave? Well, number four, it means don't use your parents as an escape hatch in crisis moments. And, and this will be a temptation. It really will. Um, your parents love you. And, and so when you need bailing out, the temptation is going to be to go to mom and dad to bail you out. But remember, you need to leave and cleave which that means working through your problems together as husband and wife. And that will bond you both even closer together as you work through those problems together. That, that will bond you together, and that's a great thing. So leave your father and mother, Jesus said, cleave to your spouse. And so that's what I needed to say to married couples. And that's... All biblical, good, sound advice. But now, I want to talk to the parents. I want to talk to those of you who are parents that have adult children that are already married, specifically. But then I want to talk to some of you who have little kids that one day, they're going to grow up and probably get married. Okay? They're going to grow up and get married. You're going to be in that boat one day. So you need to, you really need to be thinking about it, and you need to be... You need to be making some decisions now before that time comes so that it doesn't catch you off guard. As I said earlier, when God told Adam and Eve, leave your father and mother, they were probably like, huh? What's that all about? Leave your father and mother? They would soon find out what that meant when they started having kids, wouldn't they? God was preparing them and was letting them know that, hey, part of your job as a parent is you got to let your kids go. you got to let them go. They have to fully leave you, and they have to embrace their spouse. This is so hard for so many parents. I get it, man. I understand. You've raised these kids up. You held them when they were a baby. You fed them. There's a, a bond that is there with your kids, and I get it. It's one of the hardest things probably ever is just to let your kids go, fully go. And, and, but listen, it's got to be done, all right? And so there, there's some tips here from the parent end that I think will help you parents, all right? And here they are. You ready? Number one, if you're taking notes, is this. Number one is don't guilt trip your adult kids. Here's the deal. When, when you're a parent, you have a certain degree of control over your kids, right? You have, a, you have a control. You're raising them up. They're little. You have total control when they're little. As they grow up, you know, of course, you should be letting more and more of that go. But, you know, even until the time they completely leave home, you've got some degree of control in their life. Then they get married and the bottom line is, the reality is you have zero control. Once they get married, they leave your house, you have zero control. And so what can happen is, is okay, you know you can't really control them, and you know you can't boss them around anymore, so now you're going to try psychology, <laughs> you know? And, and, and so you have these control mechanisms that you use, and that's wrong. So you have to... Quit trying to control their life and just, you know, decide I, I, I'm not going to be a domineering in-law. Because what happens is when you're a domineering mother-in-law or father-in-law, when you become that, you either drive them away from you or 
you take away any joy that they have being around you. Okay? That's the first thing. Number two, don't give advice unless it's asked for. Um, and that's a, that's a toughie. But even when you see your kids doing things, I'm talking about adult kids now. They're married. They're on their own. But you see them doing things that you just know that's not going to probably work out too good. And you know it's not for their best. Unless they ask your advice, can I submit to you, they have to make mistakes like you did. You got to let them make some mistakes. And so don't interfere. Stay out of their business. You know, advice that is not asked for is seldom heeded and usually resented. Well, I learned that years ago. And I, I learned it the hard way. I mean, years ago. Back, in, back when I first became a pastor in the ministry, I, I learned that and I've never forgotten that. Advice that is not asked for is seldom heeded and usually resented. So remember that. Keep child-rearing advice to yourself. As you see them raising your grandkids. Um, that's like I saw... I thought this was cute. This was a daughter-in-law speaking. And the daughter-in-law wrote this. She said, Dear mother-in-law, I don't need you to teach me how to handle my children. I'm living with one of yours, and he needs a lot of improvement. <laughs> I'm dealing with one you raised. I live with him. <laughs> and he needs a lot of improvement. So keep child-rearing advice to yourself. You know, both of our parents were so good about this, just to brag on them. My mom's probably watching in Missouri, and as we said, Denise's mom is here. And that's one thing I really appreciate is that Denise's mom and dad and my mom and dad were that way. They did not push advice down our throats. They weren't always telling us, oh, you need to do this, you need to do that, and you need to, you know, you need to do this with the kids. And you need to do that. They didn't do that at all. And I'm so thankful for both of our parents for that. Number three, never talk negative about your child's spouse. Never talk negative about your child's spouse. Man, this is so common that, you know, mom just determined she doesn't like her son's wife, and she's not bashful about people knowing it, you know, or, or you know, uh, the wife's mother doesn't like her son-in-law and is not bashful about letting people know about it, and that's not right, you know. Sometimes people just get it in their head, and it's tough, you know, because, again, that's your kid, and unfortunately, many Many mother-in-law, many moms, it's like no, no woman would ever be good enough. Listen, Queen Esther of the Bible could show up and wouldn't be good enough for her little boy, you know? And it's like the young man that told his mom, he said, Mom, I've fallen in love. I'm going to get married. And his mom said, you are? Yeah, Mom, I'm going to get married. He said, tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to bring over three girls, and I want you to try to guess which one I'm going to marry. The mom said, okay. So the next day, he brings over three beautiful girls. They're all sitting on the sofa, on the couch there, and they chat with his mom and so forth, and they all leave. The son says, so which one do you think I'm going to marry? The mom immediately responded, the one on the right. That's amazing, Ma. You're correct. He said, how did you know that? The mom said, because I don't like her. A lot more true than we like to admit, amen? Hey, can I say this to you? Many a parent has caused their child to divorce. I mean, they literally have caused their children to divorce. They don't like their spouse, and they aren't bashful about it, and that is so wrong. Can I submit to you, your opinion really doesn't matter? <laughs> amen? It doesn't matter. You know why your opinion doesn't matter? Because you're not married to them. <laughs> so keep your opinions to yourself. Just love them. Don't try and change them. 
Um, I would say this. Apply Ephesians 4.29 to your in-law relationships. Here it is. Let no unwholesome word proceed out of your mouth, but only that which is good for building up, that it may give grace to the listeners. Number four is this. Number four, do not encourage your married children to depend on you. You know, I talked about kids that want to use their parents as an escape hatch all the time and how that's not healthy. Well, it goes the other way too. Many parents encourage that kind of behavior. Many parents want to be the hero. They want to bail their kids out of every jam and immediately fix their problems. And listen, by the way, many times it's rooted in your deep love for them. So, I mean, your heart's in the right place. It just doesn't make it right. And what can happen is that can become a control mechanism. And, and your, 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 your grown kids have to learn to stand on their own two feet. Let me say that again. Your grown kids have to learn to stand on their own two feet. You cannot come and swoop in and be the hero all the time. Now, I will say this. Most, I'm going to say that, I'm going to say that word, most, not all, because it definitely is not all. Most in-law issues, I think, come from the parent end. Most, not always, but most in-law issues come when parents cross boundaries that they got no business crossing. Parents have a really hard time letting go of their kids. And again, I understand that, but it's, it's not good. Here's the bottom line. Bottom line is this. Here we go. Married couples, embrace your oneness, fully leave your parents, and cleave to each other. Married, did you know marriage is supposed to be a picture of our union with Jesus Christ? Yeah, when we trust Christ and what he did for us on the cross, where he died for our sins, he made a full payment for our sin, what a plan of salvation. Well, when we, when we trust him, the Bible teaches that we actually become one with Christ. We are brought into a relationship of oneness with Jesus. And man, praise God, aren't you thankful that oneness of that relationship is so real and it's so deep that the Bible says that nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. That's the oneness of your relationship with Christ. Do you know that marriage is to be a picture of that oneness with Christ? Your oneness with your spouse should be like a billboard that demonstrates the oneness that we have with Christ. And so, embrace your oneness, fully leave your parents, and cleave to each other. Now, parents, let me talk to you just a second. Parents, particularly those of you with married children, parents, enjoy your married children. Enjoy their family but don't try and control them. They are, their, they are their own family unit now. So just refuse to be the domineering mother, the interfering father, the possessive parent, or the safety net every time they have a problem. Because now that they're grown, the nature of your relationship changes with them. To where now you're more of a friend to your child. You're more of a friend to them now. So love them unconditionally. One of the best things you can do is, is pray for them. Enjoy them, but let them go. You are raising your children up to boot them out of the nest. And there, there is nothing wrong with the empty nest, amen? You're raising them up to send them out. Don't ever forget that. Those of you that have little kids right now, you are raising them up to send them out one day. You are raising them up to be a spouse for somebody else one day, most likely. And you are, you know, like I said, you're raising them up to send them out, to kick them out of the nest, and they got to fly. They got to fly on their own. All right? So... 
let's do this. Um, I'm hoping that this message, I've, I've already gotten feedback on the first service this morning. Just people saying what a help that this was. And I, I know it's an issue that we all deal with. It's an issue that God in his wisdom knew we would deal with. Does God deal with it? Yes or no? Yes, yes he does. God deals with this. And so let's take God's advice. Let's apply it to our lives.